Rethinking Heroes, Life After the Military. I've spent a decade taking a bite out of conspiracy theories, unraveling urban legends, and grappling with worldwide top secret issues. I've even racked up some of their awards. Wow, I mean, first of all, what a question. Journalism is about telling the truth, all while ferreting out the bottom line. I'm a Harrison Hellraiser. Uh oh, with me, Carrie Harrison, as your guide. Rethinking Heroes, Life After the Military, with Kerry Harrison. Kerry Harrison with you. And this is Rethinking Heroes, RethinkingHeroes.com. On this episode of Rethinking Heroes, we're going to look back at Hiroshima as our current system, sit on hair trigger alert, and then a private tour coming up in just a moment into the secret underground Nazi bunker systems in Berlin, Germany. And then how throwing a giant party of 150,000 people can be considered rethinking heroism. You're going to find out why later in the show. Well, did you know that the Nazi bunkers in Berlin were built during World War II? Well, you sort of knew that. They were actually sort of built before World War I even. They were uh, the original subway system then converted into bunkers. But they were used to protect Nazi officials and their families from Allied bombing raids. The most famous of these bunkers is the Führer bunker, or the bunker for the Führer which was where Adolf Hitler and his so-called wife, Ava Brown, after 10 years of no record of kissing or even dating, committed suicide on April 30th, 1945. But then only the Russians really know, don't they? The first Nazi bunkers in Berlin were built in 1936 as a temporary air raid shelter for Hitler. These bunkers were located in the garden of the Reich Chancellery and were known as the Vorbunker or Forward Bunker. In 1944, as the Allied bombing raids on Berlin intensified, the Four Bunker was expanded to create the Führer Bunker, or the Führer's Bunker, that was dug way below that, deeper, 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 and then connected by a series of newly found tunnels. A complex of 30 rooms underground, equipped with its own power plant, water supply, ventilation system, also heavily guarded by the SS, and Hitler and his staff moved into the Führer bunker in January of 1945 as the Battle of Berlin raged on. And the bunker became increasingly crowded as the war drew to a close. And by the end of April, it was home to over 100 people. That bunker remained sealed for over 40 years. Then in 1989, the Berlin Wall fell and the bunker was open to the public, opened in quotation marks, not really open to the public, but opened so the public could know about it. The bunker is now a popular tourist destination, but you cannot go in, nor can you see it, because it is nothing more than a paved parking lot with a sign indicating that down underneath the parked cars is, in fact, that bunker. However, those other bunkers, that chain of bunkers under all underneath the subway systems, still exist. They've been hidden for decades, and I'm now going to take you through a special secret wall, five stories underground in Berlin and into one of those sealed bunkers. This tour has been made possible by the Berliner Unterwelten nonprofit, which maintains this history and tries to help people understand how these criminals were able to operate so grandly, so secretly, yet so openly. Let's for now, Adjust your earbuds or car speakers as we enter this mainstream red brick subway system and veer off path through a sealed steel door and descend way, way below the current city subway system, going back in time to the recently discovered subway and tram system envisioned by the Third Reich to transport the citizens of Berlin and beyond. Inside now, it's stunning to find the underground system virtually intact, just as it was in the 1930s, until the, the bombings sealed much of it over. But what lies beyond these intact tram and subway stations? Well, it turns out Hitler's Nazi bunker system weaves several levels alongside, filled with artifacts and a real live glimpse at history, preserved and evident, even touchable, throughout this bunker system. With history feeling like it's repeating itself these days, I'll be taking you through, thanks to a special arrangement with Berliner Unterwelten, a nonprofit devoted to finding and helping the still living victims of that Reich. 
The stairs leading into the bunkers are metal and cement reinforced, typical of the vast project of planning Hitler's ideal for Germany, a mythical urban system of complex and grand architecture he called Germania, or Germania in English. My guide is Canadian-born Stephanie Ramsey, who also happens to be an Olympic hockey champion. And who better to lead us through the often creepy, treacherous underground of world history? We're looking at a poster of Hitler's bunker. Everybody is so interested in Hitler's bunker. What happened down here? Did he commit suicide? Was there a highway leading to Tempelhof Airport? Um, it is unbelievable. The items that are in these cases are not from Hitler's bunker. Those are long gone, but they're actually from a bunker next to Hitler's bunker. It's actually called the driver's bunker. It's one of the most fascinating stories. Basically, after the war, this bunker was vacated and nobody enters it until the 90s. In the 90s when they enter it, um, things are left untouched. There is half empty beer bottles that are still without a scratch. And these are the things that you're looking at in this room. And Hitler, uh, much to the uh, curiosity of the people of Earth, we don't know where he really went, but there's all kinds of wild uh, suppositions of this and that. But at the end, he was suffering from a lot of different maladies, being treated with tons of medications. He wasn't a sane man, not that he ever was, but near the end, I mean, really, like medically speaking, bad shape. <laughs> Yeah, he was. Um, Hitler, we do know 100% confirmed. He did have Parkinson's disease. He also had many other illnesses with him. Uh, one other problem that his doctors write about is they say maybe he has cancer. Um, they're talking about a problem specifically in his eye. Is it cancer? Is he going blind? He is on so many different medications to try and fix this. How many was he on? I, it was well over 50, wasn't it? It was actually about 90 different drugs. 90? 90. 90 different drugs is recorded in the doctor's journals, one of which to actually fix the cancer in his eye they've theorized is actually cocaine. They've actually injected cocaine into his eyeball, supposedly. To keep it from twitching and flying off to the right or whatever it was doing, even more to the right than he was? <laughs> I have no idea why they were using cocaine. I mean, if I knew how the drugs worked, I'd probably be a doctor, not a historian. <laughs> well, you're, you're a social historian, which is, which is what's interesting. Instead of just counting numbers of objects in a room, you figure out why. You reverse engineer it. What makes people tick? Why do they do what they do? Harrison with you on KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles, 98.7 in San Diego, 99.3 Central California, 99.5 in New York City and on the Progressive Radio Network. We're talking to Stephanie Ramsey. She is the go-to tour guide of this underground Berlin tour where for the first time after so many years, 60, 70 years these bunkers have been opened by a company a non-profit company um, who's also trying to find the victims of the nazi crimes and help them be restored uh, financially in another way so that's really what their work is all about and by taking people on the tour we understand a fuller story as seen through the eyes of stephanie and we're looking at all these ancient relics we're looking at bombs here we're looking at rusted lugers uh, that rumble is the subway because we are underground right now in former Nazi bunkers. Uh, we're looking at rusted German helmets. Uh, these bunkers, how many miles of these things or blocks or whatever were there? Actually, nobody really knows. I mean, uh, we know that Hitler tried to build 3,000 bunkers in all sorts of shapes and sizes. We know that he actually was able to build 1,000 in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Uh, there's underground passages we don't know about yet. Um, I really have no specific number because I truly think that we'll actually be finding bunkers for years to come, which is really exciting for a young historian such as myself. Hopefully I can be a part of some of these projects. Pictures of this, by the way, are available. If you go to goharrison.com, we will have links plus some 3D pictures that I took, which I'm going to be sharing with the Berlin Unterwelten, 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 Unterwelten um, where they're going to be able to see it in 2D. Uh, hopefully, maybe they'll get some 3D paper glasses <laughs> for people for a display. But you'll see this incredible maze of Nazi tunnels, plus the relics and artifacts on here, just perfectly preserved, um, including signs and posters. And this is where the Nazis had their subterranean life. They mentally lived a subterranean life, but they, they finally found shelter, but they waited till pretty late in the war to build the bunkers because the fantasy was that they were the master race and nothing bad could happen. 
Uh, yes, certainly. I mean, um, they tell the population right from the start, we have bunkers, there's signs all over the city, we have bunkers when they actually don't. But if we're looking at Hitler's bunker, so Hitler, he cares about himself, he wants a safe bunker. In 1935, he does not have a safe bunker. It is not a bomb-proof structure, and that's because he feels that there will be a war, but he will never actually be attacked. It's not even until 1943 where he accepts the reality that though he feels they're going to win the war, the war has come to Berlin on a permanent basis. It's not until 43 where he actually builds himself a bunker that's even bombproof. And he practiced a, a very curious kind of capitalism because the life-saving devices that you pointed out, and you have all these relics down here. Again, we're down under Berlin. You can hear rumbling right now. That's the subway. That's the subway. And, and this device. is the, the original too. Um, that there were gas masks and other things, but they weren't made freely available. The Nazis sold them to the the poor people who couldn't afford them. Well, that's the thing is Nazi Germany is quite poor and the economy coll um, uh, has collapsed during the Weimar Republic and it recovers quite quick and there's a misconception that the Nazis recovered the economy and uh, Hitler did genius things. Well, he didn't. Uh, one, the economy is actually recovering from processes that had started during the Weimar Republic but are really taking off during the 30s. And two, he does things like um, he sells uh, items such as gas gas mask, um, buckets of sand, things that you could to actually protect yourself and says, if you don't buy them, you will actually die. But at the same time, uh, controversially saying Berlin will never be attacked. So it's kind of an irony that you see here in one of these uh, contradictions that is Nazi Germany. We just walked into your break room, which is, I'm now uh, like backstage in the Nazi bunkers <laughs> yeah. with, with original signs and pipes going back to World War II. Um, I noticed that many of the things, as we see in the pictures, if you go to goharrison.com under the travel tab, saying to the ladies, the Frauen or the Männer, abort. And abort in English just means to push something out or get rid of. That's really what they mean, but it's politer. Yeah, uh, definitely. I think that's a really uh, good association that you make. A lot of people don't even realize that because I ask our guests all the time, what do you think this word means? And they think about it. And yes, abort, when we think of abort or abortion, something getting out of you, that's what it is. It's actually a toilet. It's just a polite way to say toilet. It's a very old fashioned word. This word would not have been used in the 40s or the 30s, probably even the 20s, but they didn't want to use the word toilet. That's the word that they use today. It's the word they would have used back then. But toilet, that word, that's a French word, right? Do you really want a French word on a German World War II bunker? They wanted to come back to German roots, and they really only had a couple of options, so they chose a bolt. Rethinking Heroes with Carrie Harrison, Life After the Military. RethinkingHeroes.com. I'm standing underneath the German subway system underneath the traffic, underneath where people live, in fact, down so subterranean that we are where the newly discovered former Nazi bunkers happen to be located. Over a thousand of these were built. Still many secret passageways are yet to be discovered. And we're here courtesy of German tourism, who has very kindly arranged this for all of us so that we can be here to tell you this story. Plus, an organization called Berliner Unterwelten, which is raising money to help the victims of the Third Reich that may still be surviving or family members and try to restore them either financially or socially uh, in whatever ways happen to be possible. Um, I imagine you do get some, shall we say, um, uh, disrelishing people that come down here, people who actually come here thinking it's a church. Uh, certainly. Um, I mean, that's obviously a very sensitive subject because what do you do in a group of 30 people when you have somebody who comes in who's a neo-Nazi and this has actually happened. So people who believe that um, Hitler's still alive, that I- I've... Still alive? It's still alive. He was born in 1890 something? 89, 1889 and supposedly Hitler is alive today. And um, uh, yes, uh, how you handle that is actually um, quite difficult, but if you handle it in the proper way, 
it's actually a great educational tool for your group because your group of 29 other people sees how these people work, how they are not logical, how there is no way that what they're saying has any hold. And you just hope to turn it into a positive environment and a positive experience. So at the end of the 90 minutes, people come out and they feel like they've learned something and they're a little bit more enlightened. Speaking of enlightenment, the enlightening toilet uh, that we're looking at right here, uh, again, we're standing in a former Nazi bunker from World War II. That rumbling, by the way, again, is the subway. We are underground, under the subway in the old Nazi bunkers. These toilets we're looking at, um, I don't get it. How does this thing work? Oh, it's very simple. It's modern technology at its finest. It's an earth toilet. So in the space- an Earth toilet. An earth toilet. In the base of the toilet, uh, where today you have the water flowing through, it's actually earth. So you just have a tiny handle and you just pull the handle. You hear a click, and that means a scoop of dirt actually falls down into the toilet. Then you lift up the cover, you do what you gotta do. Then you pull the handle again, you'll hear another click, so more earth falls down. It's gonna twist, turn, decompose. And if you want, you can actually take Take that out into your garden and use it to sprinkle your strawberries. I'm sure that's what the Nazis told you to do. <laughs> exactly. They were always thinking about your garden. <laughs> Canadian-born Olympic hockey player Stephanie Ramsey was my guide. The several levels under the streets of Berlin were over a thousand World War II era Nazi bunkers still, mostly in secret, snake deep below this cosmopolitan and artistic cultural city. My special thanks to Kirsten Schmidt in Los Angeles for moving mountains to make this happen for us and to the Hotel Mercure in Berlin for hosting this production. Rethinking Heroes, Life After the Military. Carrie Harrison here on Rethinking Heroes. You've heard me in the past talking about Liberation Route Europe. In fact, I think one of our first shows we brought on, Remy Proud. I'm really learning my French accent as my German accents. Uh, and he's in charge of this uh, first ever retracing of the steps of the Band of Brothers. If you haven't seen that by now, I don't know where you've been for the past 20 years, but it is the top selling DVD in all history. And it retraces the steps from London all the way to the Eagle's Nest. Well, recently I got together with a company that took KPFK listeners, you with me before COVID, on the one and only opportunity to Cuba to meet Mariela Castro and get her behind the scenes tour of their medical system. Much like just now, I took you into a private tour of the Nazi bunker systems, which is not open for private tours, but this is Rethinking Heroes and we are here for education. Well, we got into their private medical system and saw a uh, shadow medical system that was outside their government that was uh, offering meds for HIV and other things that are forbidden and blocked by the uh, unfortunate embargo that goes on uh, 50 years later, choking off all supplies to them. And yet they've seen everything on TV because they have a black market that brings in thumb drives of everything that was on TV. And within a week, they've all seen more than you ever will here and you pay for the services. But that does not mean they're healthy. It does not mean they get to eat meat. It does not mean they have any food or medicine. It's a tough thing. But we took you there because we were able to do it. And we're going to set up another Cuba tour for you. Uh, this time different. Obviously, there's really no Castro's. We've seen that behind the scenes. But we're going to do another behind the scenes and take you into their agriculture and their green initiatives and some things that they're doing, not because they care, not because they're lovely and they think green is beautiful. They don't have a choice. If you can't get fertilizer, because you can't have cows, because you can't have chickens, because that takes corn, and you can't have corn because you don't get the seeds, because the seeds are owned by Monsanto, I think you get this chain of events, you end up being green, and you invent new ways to get stuff done. You need to know about that. You and I, we're all suffering in our own ways. We all need to figure and navigate the future. So we're going to put together a new Cuba trip, and we'll let you know more about that as it gets more developed and how you can participate. Uh, this special tour focused on Germany, part of which you just heard, takes people into the real history and experiences generally off limits to the general public. If you're interested in history and education into the restri restricted Nazi bunkers in Berlin, and, and we'll get some photos up there, plus areas like the Golden Room in Nuremberg or where the Nuremberg trials were held, you can learn more at carryharrison.com. Uh, we'll try to get some photos up, um, maybe even a video on rethinkingheroes.com too, so you can see it there. I'm working on one specifically for vets down 
down the road, part of liberation route Europe, where there isn't going to be much walking involved, where most of it can be done by rail. That means a bathroom every like one minute or less. It's beautiful. So stay tuned. We're going to put together more educational experiences for our listeners here, for you who matter, who have given so much for so many years. We're going to give you back and give you immersive, deep, real-time live education. Coming up around this anniversary of the Hiroshima bombing, we learned last week how close we are to being on hair trigger alert with all nuclear weapons, including the ones pointed at us. So how close are we not to drop our own, but for someone else to drop it on us? Rethinking Heroes with Kerry Harrison, Life After the Military, RethinkingHeroes.com. Kerry Harrison with you, RethinkingHeroes.com, where you can get copies of this show. You can see podcasts. You'll see videos. You'll learn more about what we're doing, all of our initiatives, and our wonderful partnering chums and buddies who've been able to help us do so many good things for you. You can learn all about it there at RethinkingHeroes.com. Well, the upcoming anniversary of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki may be more poignant right now than it has ever been in the past. Now, that seems like a shocking thing because one year after, two years, 10 years after, actually it wasn't discussed for many years after, Albert Einstein of all people started discussing it a lot and it became a thing and now we all know about it. Well, we heard last week here on Rethinking Heroes from Dennis Fritz, who's high up in Space Command and NORAD, that our nuclear weapons here, here, are on hair trigger alert, as are those of the Russians hair trigger alert. That means somebody twitches, somebody puffed on a little too much meth, somebody's having a bad day, things happen. That's the nature of humanity, and it wouldn't be the first. So it doesn't get more DEFCON scary than right now, today here, with what's going on with Russia, Ukraine, with our uh, proxy wars, their proxy wars with us and all the rest of it. And the Europeans are all in the middle because all the bombs fly overhead and fall there. So I put together a documentary for you to lay out the consequences of how such an event could occur again. Remember, our grandparents, great-grandparents, went over and fought in World War II, so this could never happen again. The Nazi bunkers could never be dug again to actually occupy bad people, so that atomic weapons could never again be used. That was the commitment, whether it was Paul Tibbetts, whether it was Einstein, whether it was any of the people that worked on the Manhattan Project, they all agreed it can never happen again, including our own great military general, that being Dwight D. Eisenhower. Well, this time, weapons that are thousands of times stronger and with the capability of destroying all life on Earth. And it doesn't take that many with today's technology. We find out that the brave military men that were doing what they thought was right at the time never even knew what they were actually being sent to do. The creation of the Manhattan Project, which, as you know, took place also in Chicago. And when I was there on CBS radio doing news, I did lots of stories on the amount of goiters in Chicago thyroid problems because it turns out uh, people didn't yet know what plutonium was, a man-made product, and were dumping it right off the end of Navy Pier in Chicago, in Lake Michigan, 200 yards off the water intake for the entire city. Uh, Let's just say Mayor Daley was not thrilled by these stories, but people have a right to know what their history is so that they can understand what their future is. And if they have sicknesses, it helps to source the sickness if you're going to deal with it. So Manhattan Project building these bombs was not out in the desert somewhere, quietly where you can watch it on the History Channel. It happened in many of our major major cities because that's where the laboratories were, many of them. So this fat man and little boy project, Manhattan Project, top secret. Nobody knew about it. Nobody knew about it. It was so top secret that many bombardiers didn't even know what was being loaded into their planes. The bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki killed 140,000 people instantly. Another 60,000 died in the following months from radiation sickness. The city was completely destroyed and the blast and heat effects were felt for miles around. Why is this so interesting to all of us? How many vets have we had on Rethinking Heroes that say, I don't want more war? They've been there. They're not pining to go back. They don't see upside in any of this. Yes, there are bad guys. Yes, we must deal with it. But just blasting each other because somebody's in a bad mood, they all agree. 
not the right choice. And as the great General Smedley Butler wrote, that book in the 1920s, War is a Racket, so many of them now agree. That's why education is important on behalf of anybody who might get involved, who might have some interstitial or meniscal uh, access or push into something that could be catastrophic for the entire human race. The bombing of Hiroshima was a turning point in the war. Japan had been refusing to surrender, but the atomic bombs showed them the power of the new weapon and the futility of continuing to fight. Japan surrendered on August 15 of 1945, ending World War II. They were actually mid-surrender, but the United States had already spent $4 billion on these weapons, and they were going to use them one way or the other and show, guess who, the Soviets, former allies, still kind of technical allies, who is boss. The atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki remain the only use of nuclear weapons in an armed conflict so far. But they're a reminder of a destructive power of nuclear weapons and the importance of peace. The Hiroshima bombing was a horrific event and killed and injured hundreds and thousands of people. A reminder of the destructive power of nuclear weapons and the importance. And we hear repeatedly from top brass that we're able to get, that are willing to come on Rethinking Heroes and tell you the truth of what's going on. We hear the same story. So here's a documentary I built for you that plays some rare audio tells the secret history of what ultimately took us into the long-lasting Cold War. And you now also know what I do until 4 a.m. every morning, unfortunately. <laughs> but I love you, and you have just as right a, a right to know as anybody else, and you're going to always be able to hear it. Rethinking Heroes with Kerry Harrison, Life After the Military. RethinkingHeroes.com Harrison Special Report Both science and industry work together under the direction of the United States Army which achieved a unique success in an amazingly short time. What has been done is the greatest achievement of organized science in history. The voice of President Harry S. Truman in 1945 after dropping two nuclear bombs on Japan. We shall continue to use it until we completely destroy Japan. Harrison, the Dr. Strangelove Report. Hiroshima was chosen as a target because it had not suffered damage from previous bombing raids, allowing an ideal environment to measure the damage caused by the atomic bomb. The population of Hiroshima was approximately 255,000. At 8.15 a.m., the nuclear bomb called Little Boy was dropped over the central part of the city. killing an estimated 80,000 civilians in a flash. In the next six months, it is estimated that 60,000 more people died due to radiation poisoning, bringing the total killed in Hiroshima in 1945 to 140,000. Since then, thousands more people have died of radiation-related causes. In fact, according to the city of Hiroshima, as of August 6th of last year, the cumulative death toll of atomic bombing victims is 237,062. Three days later, Nagasaki, one of the largest seaports in southern Japan, was hit. The nuclear weapon, known as Fat Man, contained a core of 16 pounds of plutonium-239, throwing a nuclear umbrella over Nagasaki's population which dropped in one split second from 240,000 people to 165,000. This was followed by the death of at least as many from resulting radiation sickness, cancers, and injuries. Robert Lewis was the pilot of the bomber Enola Gay, which dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. In this rare recording, we hear his reflections in which even the pilots didn't know they were dropping nuclear weapons. Well, at the infinite detonation, we were trying our best to get away from the effects of the bomb and we were to wait for a length of time until the effects reached us and uh, as far as I was concerned uh, I could uh, taste this ozone this electrical discharge in the air this went right through me and I tasted this very clearly but uh, this was from the explosion itself. this was from the explosion this taste that I uh, that I speak of was uh, 
instantaneous. At least it seems so. And uh, can you describe what you saw of the explosion over Hiroshima? We waited a minute or two and started to turn back towards the target to see what took place. And there was this most awesome sight, and that was the, the city that had been in front of us with its tributaries and bridges and trolleys all outlined clearly in front of us. It was no longer visible. Another crew member, Abe Spitzer, the radio operator on the same mission. It's a sight that you never forget because it was so unbelievable to see to my perspective, it looked like I was looking down at the sun as this red wall of fire was climbing up into the sky. It was, just, it was something that you had to see to actually believe. It's almost indescribable. In the relation of the use of the bomb today, I have a certain amount of feelings as to uh, what in my mind would justify the use of uh, this is Harrison with a special Hiroshima and Nagasaki anniversary report. The scope and extent of the devastation testify more eloquently than anything else to the enormous destructive power of the new bomb. 90% of the 75,000 buildings and dwellings in the city were completely destroyed by blast and fire. In the exclusive Sundance documentary, Original Child Bomb, voices of several atomic bomb survivors are heard. He called for me three times, but I couldn't free myself from the rubble. I said to him, mommy is coming, so hang on. But I didn't hear his voice again. People were fleeing the burning city. They threw themselves into the river. As they drank the dirty water, they drowned head first. I saw so many corpses drifting in the water. Countless bodies came floating. I couldn't bear to look. People without heads, people without arms, people with their guts hanging out, without eyes. Their skin was peeled off, hanging from their fingertips. In 1962, Nobel laureate and British philosopher, Lord Bertrand Russell, spoke of the bomb and of what atomic bomb creator Albert Einstein had revealed to him, as could be heard here in this rare Pacifica archive. But after the war, it turned out the Germans had got nowhere towards making an atomic weapon. But there was an astonishment. Was it right, having made the bomb, to have dropped it then on Hiroshima and oh, Nagasaki? Oh, oh, no, that was a dastardly and most beastly piece of wanton cruelty. The Japs were beaten. Uh, they were beaten. They were going to surrender quite soon. And uh, there was no point whatever in uh, dropping the first bomb, and when you dropped the first, there was still less point in dropping the second. And they were wanton acts of cruelty. The Americans had made this wonderful weapon, and they wanted to show it off. And if it killed some hundreds of thousands of people, well, that was a detail. So why did President Truman drop the bomb anyway? Freedom of Information Act searches have revealed new documents from the Joint Chiefs of Staff which debunk Cold War myths that the dropping of the bomb saved the lives of millions of GIs and ended World War II. By 1945, Japan was being repeatedly hammered by bombs. In fact, 119 cities had been smashed and the Japanese military was all but gutted. Japan, in effect, had been rendered helpless and bleeding. The same official archival documents from the Joint Chiefs show the Navy had been dead set against the atomic bomb providing analyses revealing that a simple naval blockade against Tokyo's harbor would have been enough to starve out remaining supplies, ensuring a full Japanese surrender. We now know that surrender talks with the U.S. were already in the works, but since the talks began to drag on, the military devised Operation Olympic, in which American forces were poised to invade Japan by wintertime. If Olympic failed, the military had Operation Coronet, in which forces would split the island in two. President Truman dropped the bomb anyway. Not once, but twice. Then to avert the growing horror by the American people, 
began to inflate the numbers of how many U.S. troops might have been saved by the bomb until President Truman hit the number of one million. Yet President Truman's own General Eisenhower had calculated that each of these non-nuclear options would have sustained casualties of only 40,000 troops. So why did Truman drop the bombs anyway? Politically, a case could be made that since Russia's Stalin had just declared war on Japan, Russia would have next effected a Japanese surrender. Then Russia, the winning country, would have had control over most of Asia. And that conflict between the U.S. and Russia eventually did develop and later became known as the Korean War. At the same time, President Eisenhower created a program called Atoms for Peace, in which he said atomic weaponry could be used to make electricity, even run cars, sending us to the moon, possibly. This, it turns out, was in the service of getting a suspicious American people on board to hyper-escalate nuclear bomb research, plus weapons manufacturing. The development of the hydrogen bomb made the World War II era atomic bombs look like TNT. But while weapons manufacturers got rich, the Soviet Union began stockpiling their own nuclear bombs. American sentiment was in favor of nuclear de-escalation, but the newly called Defense Department turned quiet skepticism to terrorizing fear by funding short so-called duck and cover documentaries shown before feature films all across America. It could be any street, any town, USA. If sudden nuclear warfare should hit America, people will have to take care of themselves. The military would have a war to fight. It is an ominous fact that man's knowledge allows him to obliterate his very civilization if he chooses. Modern science has provided bombers which can span continents and oceans. Guided missiles are expected to fly at supersonic speeds. Bombers can deliver the H-bomb. Missiles may have H-bomb warheads. The A-bomb which did this to Hiroshima is now a mere firecracker in today's lineup of thermonuclear pyrotechnics. The explosive power delivered by all bombs dropped by U.S. planes in World War II did not equal that released by the recent test explosion of an H-bomb. How much heat does an H-bomb produce? The temperature on the surface of the fireball is as great as that generated on the surface of the sun. Small wonder, then, that an H-bomb can virtually destroy everything within a radius of three miles from blast center. The blast alone is capable of gouging out a hole a mile across and 175 feet deep. If sudden nuclear warfare should hit America, people will have to take care of themselves. Here now is an illustration of fallout from a nuclear blast following a surface burst. Debris churned up and sucked into the air becomes radioactive. It will settle to the earth in patterns governed by wind currents, scattering a dangerous and often lethal residue over everything it touches. A blast over Washington, for instance, could set up a fallout pattern almost to New York. If you were not sheltered, a heavy enough radiation dosage could bring sickness or death. With the flow of normal food supplies cut off, a careful marshalling of existing stocks is absolutely imperative. Be alert today, alive tomorrow. Rethinking Heroes, Life After the Military with Kerry Harrison. Kerry Harrison with you. This is Rethinking Heroes, RethinkingHeroes.com. Don't forget, don't forget to subscribe and like Rethinking Heroes wherever you get your podcasts. They are ubiquitous, not a streaming service on the planet that does not carry Rethinking Heroes. Just ask, Rethinking Heroes, ask Alexa, ask Siri, ask yourself, why am I not listening to it all the time? Follow us across all social media simply by looking for Rethinking Heroes. Well, as one of our major political parties sees their candidate overtly attacking uh, people of color, LGBT, the entire educational system, literacy, basic human decency. One of the groups under direct assault, the LGBT community of the state of Florida, has found a way to respond. While the Human Rights Campaign has put out a travel advisory against the state of Florida as if it were Yemen or Syria, actually wrap your head around that, a travel advisory for an entire U.S. state on American soil. During your lifetime, what would you have to do to actually have a double travel advisory from both African-American and LGBT sectors? Seriously, how bad could it actually be for two complete population groups to put out travel advisories cautioning all living creatures to avoid exposure in one of our own 50 states? 
Well, this is not what our service members want overseas to risk their lives to return to. This is a new level of outrageous that we have never seen before. And it's now a third degree felony in the state of Florida to read books on paper in public that could contain content that an illiterate person who literally cannot read might have had banned at the recommendation of their governor, a governor who happens to be a failed history teacher, according to the New York Times. Raw story and a dozen other media outlets that researched Governor Ron DeSantis before his most recent run. So failed history teacher is now in charge of history for a population of 23 million people. This stuff is, is the stuff of Orwell and Huxley or Comedy Central. But it's real since lives hang in the balance. And uh, his plan, now that he's announced to run for president, is to make America Florida without the palm trees. But it's a brilliant way to combat the stated war zone that is now the state of Florida, formerly known as the Sunshine State. This next hero has rethought a form of positive civil disobedience that's filled with good, clean fun that's flooding the states with fresh tourism. Well, the governor has destroyed tourism, knocked Disney off its axis, lost a billion dollar project with a B, billion, with 20,000 new jobs now gone. This hero has devised a benefit to the residents of his state, a benefit to his state economy, a reminder to the residents of Florida who have no voice in the politics of their own government. Turns out that their state is one of tourism and not a glowing sepulcher for the freshly exhumed body of the late Anita Bryant. What if a savvy entrepreneur threw one of the largest parties the state of Florida has ever seen? What if his guest list came from all 50 states in Europe? Well, let me introduce to you Joseph Clark, the CEO of Gay Days, which is breathing some enormous financial breath back into Orlando's Disney World, which has steadfastly defended the First Amendment and the voices of smaller people than itself. That'd be Disney, smaller than Disney, and all the folks who are not able to defend themselves from a gigantic state government. Mr. Clark, who comes from an enormous sports franchise background, will be bringing in 150,000 tourists to the city of Orlando to wash it in money, enjoy its hospitality, have the complete Disney-supported experience, and squeegee the soiled glass of the Tallahassee Funhouse Mirror. If you really want to see real power, inspire people to show up. Cowards can only intimidate people to stay away. Joseph Clark, I want to welcome you to Rethinking Heroes. Thank you for having me, Carrie. It's a pleasure. I hope that was a uh, small enough introduction for you. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? But, um, you know, no pressure or anything. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> let, let, let's jump right into it. Joseph Clark, you've worked with the Pittsburgh Pirates, an MLB team, NBA All-Stars, the Kentucky Derby, Texas A&M College Football, the U.S. Open Tennis Tournament, and many, many more. You recently left to work full-time with Gay Days, incorporated as CEO and co-owner. So you come from a giant sports background, and you've translated it into fun with a totally cool message. You know, it's sports and entertainment. Uh, huge part of sports is the entertainment aspect. Uh, you know, my focus was on the food and beverage side of operating all of that, but you know, put tens of thousands of people through a stadium in a matter of hours. And yeah, I, I've had a little bit of experience. This has giant global optics because during all of these don't go, don't go, we're getting go, go, and it's going to be fun. And, you know, you're bringing in a population larger than three or four American cities, and they're going to put money back in the pockets of an economy that hurts. So you may think you're throwing a party, but the side effects of what you're doing are massive, and you are being seen by a hero of thousands of merchants all across central florida right now for your gay day disney's coming up uh end of this month end of may end, all the way end of next week early june actually yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It's the end of next week again so, it is. so tell it's, us it's a massive undertaking and go ahead well actually i jumped on you and that's the beauty of zoom uh it's efficient but boy does it have a lag but I'm not going to lag. I'm going to jump right into it. What is it that people can expect when they come and join your party? Unity and togetherness. Uh, and also the ability to be seen and be comfortable. You know, we've had anywhere from presidents of theme parks uh, having conversations with custodians at the same theme parks uh, at our events. 
and nobody cares who you are and where you come from as long as you embrace the sense of we're all here together to have a fun time. So at the event itself, we've got anywhere from drag shows to our business and travel expo to bingos to pool parties, of course, um, where all the fun happens. And nobody is afraid. And I think that's kind of the point is that if you're being attacked by what appears to be fascism, not my word, uh, but I'm just using the New York Times and military generals calling it that, um, that standing up to that is actually the only cure, like fighting Nazis. That's the only cure. Um, but you're doing it through throwing a party, which I think is brilliant. It's brilliant. You're not marching around with a sandwich board. You're having a party. No, and there's no, money no. flying around. Yeah. <laughs> I know, even better, right? Um, and it is a party. There is plenty going on for everybody for it. So, yeah, I mean, we're standing up against so much. And we've stood up in the past. You know, the founders of Gay Days, uh, they've had the Jerry Falwells with the sandwich boards. They've had the um, million moms out there marching against them. The plane still flies over annually warning guests it's Gay Days at Disney. But... You know, it's getting to be even bigger than that because we're dealing with laws and we're dealing with a uh, state let that is actively pursuing LGBTQ plus people. Well, and you're captaining this thing and showing us uh, delicious ways of good, clean civil disobedience uh, in an era where much of the state, I mean, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, Tampa Bay, I mean, let's face it, it's like California. And what would Disney be if you took away all the gays? I That's know, right. right. Half, the, That's half those cast members have got to be family members of mine, you know? And just quickly, I understand the police force in Orlando has a giant LGBT contingent. Yeah, it's called Goal, and it's a uh, gay officers uh, association league. Um, and in Orange County, it's it's a fairly decent sized um, group of people that have come together. So that's where, you know, when I try to reassure people about their safety during the course of our events, um, we have support. We're, we're Orlando is a blue a blue speck in a sea of red, um, and so they are very much in support of uh, what we do and of LGBTQ plus people. Let's give out your website quickly, Joseph Clark. Where can people learn more? Yeah, uh, head over to gaydays.com. You'll see all of our event lineup uh, times. You can buy tickets to our events. Um, our host hotel is a double tree by Hilton Orlando at SeaWorld. Um, you would book your room directly through uh, our website and it's going to be a fun time. We're going Great. to ensure it's a fun time because I feel that that's what everybody needs right now. It's what they need, and people need to get together and fight things that are just bad. I want to thank you, Joseph Clark, CEO of Gay Days. Uh, you come from a giant sports background. You have spun successful sports franchising into fighting for the humans, the live humans that matter, that vote, that, that are part of the service in every way of being of service. Thank you so much. Carrie Harrison with you. This is Rethinking Heroes, and I look forward to seeing you. Rethinking Heroes with Carrie Harrison, Life After the Military, RethinkingHeroes.com.